Welcome back to part eight of Data Science Dojo's Introduction to Text Analytics with R. I'm your host, Dave Langer. So what we've got here is an RStudio environment set up with all the code ran through the end of video number seven. And in particular, what we're gonna start with is our latent semantic analysis. The last video we talked about the theory, we went through a bunch of slides, talked about the intuitions and the mathematics behind it. Now we're actually gonna show how you do latent semantic analysis, LSA, in R. And in particular, we're going to leverage a package, the IRLBA package, this package right here, to actually perform the singular value decomposition, the SVD, the matrix factorization that actually makes, makes uh, LSA work. So, first up, of course, obviously, we need to load the package. Now, this package is really, really nice because what it does is it's known, what it does what is known as truncated SVD. And we should talk a little bit about that before we run the code. Now, as we discussed last time, SVD is a mechanism by which we can accomplish a number of goals. One is we can enrich our data. We can use it to extract out higher level semantic relationships between terms. For example, we use the, uh, the hypothetical scenario of credit cards and loans and debt are all terms in my document term matrix. It would be nice if we could extract out a single higher level feature relating to the concept of debt that covers all three of those things. And this is exactly what SVD does. Now, in particular, what SVD, what this package does, the, the IRL BA package allows you to do is truncated SVD, where you can tell it, look, I only want out of all of those extracted terms that you can, that you can create using SVD, I only want the X number of most important, the most significant. And this is known as truncated SVD because instead of calculating all of those extracted features, all of those what are known as right singular vectors or left singular vectors, those are those, those concepts that we're talking about. You can just say, look, just give me the most, the 300 most important, and it will only do the 300 calculations that it needs. And the reason why that's important is because it allows the algorithm to scale, and it also allows the algorithm to run faster than if it calculated all of these uh, right singular and left singular vectors, i.e. those higher level semantic constructs. It would take a lot longer if it calculated all of them and only gave you the first 300 that were worthwhile. So this one actually just finds the first 300 and gives you the first 300. So that's really, really cool. So, but that being said, this code will still take a while to run. As we talked about, one of the, one of the downsides of using SVD, you know, what we discussed is there's no such thing as a free lunch in machine learning or data science. The power that you get from using SVD um, as part of your latent semantic analysis you, you pay for it, you have, you, have to, you have to run the code, you have to do the calculations, and it takes a while. So let's go ahead and take a look at the code, and then we'll run it, and what I'll do is we'll cut from, cut from the video, so you don't have to wait for it to run, obviously, that would take too long, and we'll just sh show you exactly what the results are in terms of processing time. Okay, so here is the meat of our singular value decomposition. Is this just, just this one line of code. And as always, of course, never hesitate to use the help system. Okay, find a few approximate singular values and corresponding singular vectors of a matrix. Okay, so as I said before, the concept of singular values, that's that thing that we saw in the previous video, which is called sigma, that's the singular values, correspond to the singular vectors. And the singular vectors and the singular values are the pieces of the mathematics that represent that higher level abstracted relationship that I was talking about. Again, using our scenario as the frame of reference, uh, SVD finds that credit cards and loans and debt can all be combined together and extracted out into a higher level concept known as, let's just call it debt, just debt. In the mathematics, there would be a singular value and some corresponding singular vectors to that higher level construct. And if you remember from the previous video, there is a U matrix, which represents the correlation of the vec of the terms, excuse me. So the left singular vectors would be the terms, and the right singular vectors were in that V transpose matrix, and the right singular vectors correspond to the documents. So you get 
both the term perspective and the document perspective at the same time, which is super useful depending on what you're trying to do. But those singular vectors, those matrices, will now include the 300 most relevant extracted higher level concepts from our term, or term document matrix. Okay, cool, so that's what we're doing. Now notice that per the last video, our current representation is a document term matrix. Documents are the rows, terms are the columns. But as I indicated, in general, when you do latent, latent semantic analysis in SVD, it actually assumes a, the transpose, where the rows are actually the terms and the columns are actually the documents. So the T function, and as always, don't hesitate to use that, matrix transpose. So this essentially says, look, take this matrix and make what are currently the columns, now the rows, and what are currently the rows, make them the columns. So that essentially flips our matrix from a document term matrix to a term document matrix, which is what all the mathematics expect. So that's what this, this code does right here. This code right here, very simple, this code right here. Okay, next up is NV. So let's go back, and if we scroll down here on the help file for the IRLBA function, NV is the number of right singular vectors to estimate. The number of right singular vectors to estimate. So this is the corresponding higher level constructs pulled out from the documents. Give me the right, give me these, give me the vector representation of the higher level concepts extracted on a document basis, on the per document basis, the document perspective. Okay? Now if we scroll up a little bit, what we'll see here is that by default, NU equals NV. And we know that NV is the right singular vectors, the vectors that correspond to the documents. NU corresponds to the left singular vectors, or the terms. Because remember, on the left side is the term perspective, the correlations of the terms, and on the right perspective is the correlation of the documents. So what this says is by default is if you don't tell it otherwise, if you create 300 right singular vectors, I'm also going to create 300 left singular vectors, which is what we want. So we set NV to 300. And as I mentioned in the last video, research has shown that SVD tends to be particularly effective in the several hundred range. Now, ideally, you can you'll take the time to play around with this in a production type scenario, right? You'll say, is 250 better than 300? Is 350 better than 300? And you can kind of dial in the number of vectors that give you the best results. We're just using 300 here because it's a reasonable starting point based on academic research. And as we'll see, it actually works pretty well. Is it optimal? Maybe, maybe not, but it's beyond the scope of this particular video series to tune how many singular vectors we need. But in fact, you would do that in a production scenario. Next up on this code is max it. This just tells you how many iterations of the algorithm should you run at a maximum. So if, if the algorithm can find all 300 singular vectors in less than 600 iterations, it will stop. But at most, it will do 600 iterations. And we're just picking the number, I'm just picking a number double, the number of singular, um, singular vectors that we need because usually it works pretty well in practice because this will find 300 singular vectors um, in 600 iterations, within 600 iterations. Okay, and then that will create essentially a return object which we'll take a look at after the code executes, which will include the sigma, the singular values, the U matrix, which is the um, correlation matrix for the higher level concepts from the term perspective, and then the V transpose matrix, which is the higher level extracted concepts from the documents perspective. And that V matrix actually becomes our brand new training data, as we'll see later on. Okay, so let's go ahead and highlight all this code. And we'll set it off and running. And we'll come back to the video after it's done executing so you can see you know, how, much, how long it's going to take so we can set your expectations if you decide to run this code on your own computer. Okay, so we'll take a break and come back when this code's done executing. Welcome back. As we can see here, it took almost 14 minutes for the singular value decomposition to run on my laptop, which is well, it's not a it's it's not an in, it's not a small machine. It's not necessarily a big machine either. So, 
uh, on a workstation or a server class machine, you can get this number down a bit, but figure it's going to take you a while to run singular value decomposition. And as the size of your matrices grow, this gets even more and more um, significant in terms of uh, in terms of how long it takes to process. Now, the good news is, is that the IRLBA package will leverage various sparse matrices inside of R. That will help out quite a bit, especially for very large matrices. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into that in, in more detail. Uh, feel free if you're interested to post on the comments section and we can we can take that up there. Okay, so we've got our singular value decomposition completed. So let's take a look at our new training matrix. Now first up, you'll notice that I'm accessing the V matrix. And if you're interested in more details about the return values from the function call, you can go down here to the help file, scroll down, to the section called value. This is, this is the standard where, place in our help files where functions will tell you what they return back, the structures of the things that they return back. So this particular function returns a list with the entries. D, which is the singular values. This is the sigma that we saw in the slides from the previous video. U, which is the left singular values. Left singular values are the higher level concepts extracted from the perspective of the terms in the matrix. V is the right singular vectors, which are the embodiment of the extracted terms from the perspective of the documents. So this line of code right here says, hey, take a look at the new features for our documents. So if we hit, go ahead and pull this up, you'll notice that we get 3,901 entries right, which is makes sense because we have 3,901 documents. And you'll see here the 300 columns that we now have. Now this won't show all of them because just because of the nature of the display, it shows you the first 100. But notice, notice the naming convention, V1, V2, V3, V4. That's by design because you don't actually know what these things really mean anymore because they are simple mathematical constructs. This is, this is what's known as a, a opaque or a black box technique. You have to trust in the mathematics that essentially says, look, these 300 columns are now the single most important, the single most significant, the single most feature rich, information rich representations of the data, the higher level concepts extracted out of the term document frequency matrix. So maybe this one has to do with things like Hey babe, let's say. I don't know. I'm not making this up, right? Maybe someone texted the words hey babe in the SMS message, let's say. And this one is essentially the higher level concept of those two words mixed together. You wouldn't know that. But that's okay because in the end, we're not really necessarily looking at um, trying to understand the interpretability of the model. We're trying to create the most effective model possible, right? How do we detect between ham and spam? So this is often a trade-off that you see in machine learning where you give up the ability to actually explain what's going on to get more power. And this is replete in all kinds of scenarios. SVD is one, uh, artificial neural networks is another, uh, deep learning in particular. It's very difficult to explain how a deep neural network actually works to anyone because it's, a, it's primarily a black box technique. So there's research trying to improve that, but in general, just, just know that this is, this is true, right? Once again, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Oftentimes, you will give up explainability for effectiveness, for power. And this is an example right here. Okay, so that's our new, our new training data set, right? We have 300 columns, 3,901 rows. That's, this is great because now we can start looking at using other types of algorithms that would take just, just god-awful amounts of time to train. For example, we wouldn't want to train random forests on all 29,200-some-odd columns of data. It would just take forever to build random force with that much data. So this is, this is a much better representation because now we can start building random forests uh, effectively because now we have a much more compact representation. Okay, so as we talked about in the video last time, in video number seven, as with TFIDF, when we use singular value decomposition, we're essentially creating a projection of our data into a new geometric space. Now, this is a recurring theme throughout this series, and it's a super important. You know, we take, originally we take our raw text documents and we create bag of words models out of them. 
those bag of words models can be represented in, in the vector space model geometrically. We saw that in the last video. We can represent them as vectors. We can then add to those things like bigrams and trigrams, thereby increasing the number of features we have, increasing the number of dimensions. But the core idea of the bag of words model is, is that you can have, you know, you, you can map them to this vector space model, these vectors. Then we improved again by putting TFIDF on top of all that, which then translates to yet another geometric representation because we're transforming the numbers in the vectors using TFIDF calculations. And now lastly, we're doing it one more time using SVD. So we've gone from simple word counts to TFIDF um, calculated numbers for those, for those uh, cells in the, in the data frame. And then lastly, we're using singular value decomposition to recalculate numbers in a smaller space. We've gone from 29,200 and some odd columns of data down to 300, which means every time that we want to use data that wasn't part of our original training set, we will need to do the same transformations, the same projections to make that new data match the vector space that we trained our machine learning model on. So this code right here shows you an example of that using our training data. Now, the last slide in video seven showed you what the transform was. And the transform was essentially take the inverse of sigma times the transpose of the U matrix times the TF-IDF document. So this line of code represents that math that we saw at the very last part of the very last slide in video number seven. Here's how you get the constituent pieces. So D, D, returned back from our call to IRLBA, is our singular values. That maps to sigma. The inverse essentially is just one divided. So the inverse is essentially one over these values. And that gives us the sigma inverse portion of our mapping calculation. Next up, U transpose, not surprisingly, just take the U matrix that's returned by our IRLBA and tran transpose it using the transpose function. Nothing's nothing serious going on there. And the document, just for grinsies, we'll just take the first document, right? So this says, go to this data frame, which is our TFIDF representation of our training data. Just grab the first row and all the columns, please, and make that my document. Cool. So document hat should be all of this mathematically multiplied together. And if you're not familiar, notice that this syntax right here, percent, asterisk percent, that is how you do matrix multiplication in R, as opposed to just regular old multiplication. So matrix multiplication. Okay, so now what we can do is we can compare the logic just to illustrate that this calculation right here, this calculation right here works. It, this is the way you map a TFIDF document into the singular value decomposition at a uh, um, semantic space. Okay, so document hat, if we look at the first 10 values, and then if we take a look at the first 10 values of the first document in our new training matrix, right, which is the, the V singular value matrix, you'll notice that for the most part, the values are exactly the same. Not all of them. They're not, they're very, very close. So for example, the first three are all the same. They're exactly the same. But then notice the fourth one is a little bit different. But notice that these are at e to the negative 17th. These numbers are exceedingly small, exceedingly small. So even though they're not exactly the same, like for example, here's Here's one that's actually quite a bit different. This one's a negative and this one's positive. Notice that they're still very, very small numbers. Extremely small numbers. Extremely small numbers. So in fact, what'll happen is we'll see later on uh, when we study cosine similarity, if I calculated the cosine similarity between these two vectors all up, all 300 values of each vector, did a cosine similarity, the value that I'll get back is one. Because these values are so small, and there are so many of them, there are 300 of them, once you calculate the similarity, they will come back exactly one. So essentially, mathematically, these two things are equivalent, which is exactly what we expected, right? This shows you how you actually map an arbitrary document that's been TFIDF'd using our functions that we've defined in our previous videos 
I can take any piece of data now, whether that's the test data that we held out at the beginning of the series or brand new data in production, this shows you how you mathematically project that TFIDF document into the semantic space and we can create predictions from it. Sweet. Okay, moving on. So, how do we use this in practice? Well, that's actually pretty easy. So what we can do here is we can create a new data frame, which we can call train.svd, and we need our labels, of course. So first up, we'll grab all the labels, all 3,901 labels of ham and spam, and then we say, look, create a new data frame, and then have one column that's our labels, and then have the other column be the 300 new features that we've created as embodied by the V vector that gets returned back from the IRLBA function. This is our new training data, right? This is our this is our refined data, our reduced data, the higher signal data based on these higher level relationships between terms and documents in our term document frequency matrix. Okay, so we've got our new data frame. And not surprisingly, we can go ahead and also run this code one last time. And we'll go ahead and run this. I'm gonna change it to three because I'm running on my laptop here. And what we'll do is we'll run our part for one last time, one last time. So I'll just go ahead and run that. And it'll take a while to run. So we will go ahead and cut out and then come back when it's done executing. But it, well, before, before we go and do that, I should mention one thing. This is the last time that we're gonna be using the R part algorithm because now that we have a smaller dimensional space, we can actually work with more powerful algorithms like the random forest. And what we'll see is the random forest will give us quite a bit of uplift. Oh, actually that ran pretty quickly. Never mind, we didn't have to break at all. Excellent. So we've got 25.8 seconds-ish, which is pretty quick. So if we take a look at our results here, we can see that our best accuracy was right here at 93.36. So as, as, we, as we talked about previously in the last video, we added bigrams and what we saw was that a single decision tree actually performed a little bit worse with the bigrams than it did with just the single unigram matrix, matrices. And now what we see here is that we've actually reduced our performance even further by using SVD. Because as we talked about in the last video, SVD is an approximation. So essentially what this is saying is that from the perspective of a single decision tree, we've lost signal by doing two things. One, by adding bigrams, and then by adding SVD on top of the bigram matrix, unigram bigram matrix, we've lost even more signal. So we've actually reduced from our high, if you recall, our high was a TFIDF unigram matrix with a single decision tree, and it was around 94.7% accurate. Now we're down to about 93.4%. So we've lost more than one percentage point. Now the good news is, is that we will gain, we will gain everything that we lost back and more because now we can use the mighty random forest algorithm. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, so before we do that though, we need to do, we need to take a step back and understand what's gonna, what's gonna happen here. And this is documented in the code for posterity, but I'll go ahead and talk about it anyway, which is this. We're gonna use random forests because they're powerful. They're, they're a great general purpose algorithm in our, in our boot camps that I teach, I tell, tell my students all the time, if there was only one algorithm that you, if you were stranded on a desert island, let's go that way, if you were stranded on a desert island and you could only have one machine learning algorithm, which one would you take? And I, well, I would advise you take the random forest because it is a great general purpose algorithm. It has many, many qualities about it that make it very, very desirable. However, it's not necessarily the fastest algorithm in the world to train. So we should talk a little bit about that. So the random force is powerful, it's useful, it's awesome, but it does take a while to train. And I wanna explain the math of why that's gonna be the case. So here's the deal. So our process that we follow right now is we do tenfold cross-validation repeated three times. Now, as we saw previously with our part, and I didn't go into much detail on this, but I will now, 
We also tune over seven different values of a tuning parameter. In the case of our part trees, it was CP, the complexity parameter. I didn't bother going into it in any level of detail because I knew that we weren't going to be using our part as our serious algorithm. We were going to use random forest. So I will go into detail on that going forward on what that means. But in terms of just the raw math, in terms of just the raw processing time, you need to understand that we're doing tenfold cross-validation, repeated three times, and then we do that, we do that process, that three full, the tenfold cross-validation repeated three times, again, a, a total of seven times overall, because we're using seven different values of the, the parameter to find out which one is the best, which is the best parameter value to use. And then lastly, the Mighty Random Forest by default builds 500 decision trees per random forest. So that gives you this math right here. 10 times 3 times 7 times 5. And then at the very end of the process, once Carrot has found what the optimal value for the parameter is out of the 7 that it tried, which one works the best, it builds one more random forest using that value with all of the training data. That's this 500 right here. So when you add this all up, what you get is our process is going to build 105,500 trees over our data, which is 3,901 rows of 300 columns. So, as you might imagine, that's a lot of processing. So this takes a lot of time. So for example, using the 10 core workstation that I've been using throughout this series, it took 28 minutes using 10 cores simultaneously to actually run this process through and build a random forest. Now the good news is, is that we're going to get pretty good estimates of our accuracy. We have good estimates of how well this model should perform in production. The bad news is, is that it's going to take about a half hour every time that we test this. So as a result, what I've done for this video series is I've ran this code previously and I've cached the results in the GitHub as binary files that we can load up so we don't have to run the code every single time. You can go ahead and do that if you'd like. Feel free to do it, but you won't have to. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. So you can see here, here's all of the code and it's commented out. And you can go ahead and un, you know, uncomment it, of course, and run it if you would like. But notice that it's gonna take quite a while to run. Quite a while to run. But if you get the, the, the R data file, the binary from the GitHub, you can just run this line of code and it loads up into the memory space and now we can just check out the results, lickety split. Okay, so here is the output of us running the Mighty Random Forest. So I'm not gonna drain all of this up here. We've talked about it before. This essentially just uh, is output that tells you what Carrot did. What we're gonna focus on, as I mentioned earlier in the video, is this right here. In particular, we're going to ignore the Kappa statistic in favor of other metrics that we'll see later from the confusion matrix function. What we'll concentrate on are these two columns, mTry and accuracy. Now, essentially, we don't have time to go into how the random forest algorithm actually works at base. So feel free to get on YouTube, do a quick search on random forest, and you can find lots of great tutorials on how the random forest algorithm works. What mTry is specifically, and I'll be very brief about this, is essentially a parameter that controls how much data gets used in building the individual trees. How much data gets used in building the individual trees. Now, as we know from before, random forests by default in R build 500 trees. But as each individual tree gets built, you can specify how much data gets used for each tree. And specifically what mTry is, is the number of randomly selected columns that each tree gets to use to build itself. So this is a way of constraining the amount of data each individual tree gets to see. And obviously that will have different levels of impact. As you might imagine, the less data you have, the trees will tend to be less accurate overall because, well, they have less signal to work with. And you may suspect that in general, as you get more data, so for example, right here at an mTry value of 300, all 300 columns are available to every single tree. They get access to all the data you would think that, in, that that would lead you to always have the best results, but in fact, it's not. Usually it's somewhere in between these two extremes of very little data, right? This would be, you only get two columns 
out of 300 to work with, which isn't very much data at all, all the way up to 300 columns, which is all the data. And what we find here is that for the binary saved out for the run that I did previously on the workstation, somewhere in the middle is the Goldilocks zone, 151. So the best random forest was built using approximately half the data being available to each individual tree in the random forest. That's how you should interpret mTRI. And we've just we've just went through seven different values and honed in on one right here. So using about half the data for each individual tree in the random forest produced us the best accuracy of 96.753%. Now what's interesting here is that this is about two percentage points higher than the best single R part tree, which shows us that as, as I mentioned earlier in the video, the random force is actually better able to make use of the data preprocessing pipeline that we have. And in particular, it's able to make better use of the LSA SVD matrix factorization than a single decision tree is. Okay, cool. So moving on, we can also get more interesting results by using the confusion matrix function from caret. Now, as always, don't hesitate to, oops, confusion matrix. And you can see right here, this is, this is a great function. It produces a lot of detail. So we'll go ahead and run this. And we'll go into more detail in later videos because we're going to explore all of these, well, not all of them, but a number of these, uh, these metrics here more closely as we tune our model and try and zone in on the best model that we can. But what I did want to call out real quickly is one thing. Notice that the accuracy reported is a little bit higher. That's because we're working with all the data here, all the data, as opposed to cross-validation where you're only working with, with tenfold cross-validation, you're working with 90% of the data, nine-folds, is what you use for training, and then 10% you're using for your testing. So here we have all the data, so we get slightly better results, 96.8. But notice here we get this nice confusion matrix, not surprisingly, and this shows us a couple things. One, when we predict HAM, we're pretty good. We got 3,371 correct, which is nice. And then we erroneously allow seven pieces of spam through. We said, in fact, these SMS messages were spam, but we said they were ham, they were okay. That, you know, that's, that's, that's something we can improve, but this is actually pretty good. Looking at this confusion matrix, this is the line where we're actually probably going to want to focus because here we allowed 117 legitimate SMS messages to be labeled, to be predicted to be spam. And generally what we're gonna to wanna to do is, is, is concentrate on fixing this if we can, because it's probably likely that our customers are gonna be more dissatisfied in the scenario where we move their SMS messages, let's say to a spam folder erroneously, than they are to get an occasional spam message coming through into the legitimate folder on their phone, let's say. so. This is definitely something we're going to want to concentrate on going forward. And we'll use the confusion matrix function in the next, in the upcoming videos to actually help us with that. All right. So I'll go ahead and end there. So hopefully you're enjoying the video series. You're finding it useful. If you have any questions or concerns, uh, feel free to use the comments section on the YouTube page for this video. We at Data Science Dojo monitor our YouTube channel frequently and try to answer any and all questions promptly. Next up, if you like what we're doing on the channel, please subscribe. We'll be publishing new tutorials weekly, and then that way you can keep abreast of the latest content. Also, if you like what we're doing more generally at Data Science Dojo, feel free to follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook, and you can tap into a, uh, a font of curated data science goodness by following us on social media. And lastly, I hope to see you in an upcoming Data Science Dojo Bootcamp. I'm Dave Langer, and I'm wishing you very happy data sleuthing.